Welcome to FilmmakerIQ.com. I'm John Hess, and today we'll dissect the history of horror. The history of horror is a vast and perhaps foolhardy thing to tackle. No matter how hard you try, there are films and horror subgenres that will slide through the cracks. But horror is somewhat unique among film genres in that there is a recognizable pattern that happens again and again. A film will come along and terrify an audience, capturing their imaginations and making bank. Filmmakers flock to this cash cow like vampires to blood, which leads to sequels and imitators, sometimes better than the original. But eventually sequels run out of steam, and the subgenre created by this original smash hit fades into memory, lurking in the corners of history waiting to be rediscovered and rebooted. This process is commonly referred to as horror cycles. Although other genres behave similarly, the unique appeal of horror from its low-budget requirements to broad multinational appeal make horror especially susceptible to these boom and fade cycles. But as we look at how the genre changes over time, we must not think of the history of horror as being a rigid, one-way street. And new films borrow from old films all the time, a constant remix of subgenres and new filmmaking technologies that make something relevant for contemporary culture. So who did the first horror films borrow from? While well, monsters, murderers, demons, and beasts have been around since antiquity, ghost stories told around campfires since we as a species learned how to talk. But the roots of filmed horror were an extension of the genre of literature that got its start in the late 1700s, Gothic horror. Developed by writers both in Great Britain and the United States, the Gothic part of the name refers to the pseudo-medieval buildings that these stories took place. Think of an old castle on a dark and stormy night, gloomy forests, dungeons, and secret passageways. Famous Gothic writers include Mary Shelley, Bram Stoker, and of course, Edgar Allan Poe. It was from Gothic literature that the first horror films found inspiration, and why not? The genre was popular both in books and theater at the time. Although the term horror did not come into use for film until the 1930s, early filmmakers and film goers certainly showed an interest in the macabre, as evident in this snippet of a spook tale from 1895 created by the Lumiere brothers. In 1896, Georges Méliès would go on to create what is considered the first horror film ever made, The Manor of the Devil, with bats, castles, trolls, ghosts, and a demon, played by Georges Méliès himself. You can see the elements of gothic horror are already firmly entrenched by this time in the public psyche. A silent films in the teens and 20s were still exploring the possibilities of this new filmmaking medium. Several experiments were conducted, including the first Frankenstein, adapted by Thomas Edison Studios in 1910, and Dante's Inferno by Giuseppe de Liguero in Italy in 1911. But the heart of horror in silent films would start to beat only after the conclusion of the First World War and in the ashes of the tattered country of Germany. German Expressionism was a style of cinema that emphasized expression over realistic depictions of our real world. Starting off as a rising movement throughout Europe, German filmmakers and artists developed their unique style inside a cultural bubble that was the result of embargoes in place during World War I. Without the influx of an already internationally powerful Hollywood, the German cottage film industry grew quite quickly and creatively. A consortium of German industries came together to convince the German military of the importance of a national film unit. This would become the Universum Film Aktiengesellschaft, the UFA. But by the time the company was operational, Germany had lost the war, and the UFA turned its goals to producing films for commercial profit. On the slate in 1919 was a film written by Karl Mayer and Hans Janowitz, with Robert Wiener set to direct. 
the result would be a film that would go on to be the great granddaddy of all horror films, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. In the first few years of the Weimar Republic, electricity was still scarce, and German industries were allotted power on a quota basis. A UFA had used up almost all their quota that year, so the filmmakers of the Cabinet of Dr. Caligari decided to paint shadows onto the set rather than create them naturally with electric light. Well, this technique combined with sharp angles and bizarre perspective distortion created an unforgettable look that established German expressionism both artistically and as a commercially popular style of cinema. German filmmakers continued the tradition of expressionist horror films with The Gollum, How He Came Into the World in 1920, which was lensed by Karl Frunt, who also shot Metropolis, and F.W. Murnau's Nosferatu in 1922. The German film industry did well in the immediate post-war era, much better than the rest of the German economy, which was mired in runaway inflation due to the war reparations that Germany was obliged to pay under the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, fortunately for the film industry, people flocked to the movies because it was the only form of entertainment that people felt they were getting their money's worth. Uh, Berlin became a cultural center of Europe, despite this shaky economy. Well, to stabilize the currency, World War I allies offered Germany the Dawes Plan in 1925, which is a system of loans and agreements aimed to try to get the economy back under control. Unfortunately for the Filmmakers, the Dawes plan also curtailed German film exports. The result was many independent studios lost financing and shut down for good. Even the national studio UFA was at the brink of collapse in 1925. A good opportunity, though, for Hollywood to come in and swallow up a once powerful foreign competitor. Paramount and MGM lent $4 million in exchange for collaborative rights to UFA studios, theaters, and personnel, establishing the Perufa Met Distribution Company in 1926. This agreement effectively moved German Expressionism into Hollywood, as scores of artists traveled to the U.S. to work in Hollywood studios. Many German artists decided to stay permanently, some even returning as refugees from the growing German Nazi movement in the 1930s. The German immigrant contribution would leave a lasting mark on the style of films for years to come. It's hard to overstate the effect that sound had on transforming cinema in the late 1920s. It was a radical artistic leap, and probably more so for horror than any other genre except perhaps the musical. Well, just try turning off the sound of your favorite horror film. It just wouldn't have the same impact. Now, in tightly controlled Hollywood studio systems of the 1930s, there was one studio that would be responsible for the first cycle of horror films, Universal Pictures. One rung beneath the big five were the little three, Universal, Columbia, and United Artists, who made and distributed pictures but didn't have any theater holdings. During the silent era, Universal was responsible for the few achievements in American horror, most notably The Phantom of the Opera and The Hunchback of Notre Dame, both starring Lon Chaney. But in the 30s, Universal really sunk their teeth into horror, kicking off the Universal Gothic horror cycle. Their first hit was Dracula, directed by Todd Browning and lensed by UFA cinematographer Carl Frunt, starring the Hungarian Bela Lugosi in 1931. I am Dracula. Oh, it's really good to see you. I don't know what happened to the driver and my luggage and... Well, and with all this, I, 
I thought I was in the wrong place. I bid you welcome. James Whale continued the cycle with Frankenstein with Boris Karloff, also shot in 1931. Karl Front even got a shot at the director's chair with The Mummy in 1932, followed by James Whale again with The Invisible Man in 1933, Stuart Walker's Werewolf in London 1935, and Hambert Hilliard's Dracula's Daughter in 1936. But the universal gothic horror cycle began to lose steam and fall into the pit of self-parody with titles like The Invisible Man Returns, The Mummy's Hand, and Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman. Moving into the 40s, Universal Monsters stables started to be treated like Batman villains, bringing them all together in 1944's House of Frankenstein and 1945's House of Dracula. And by 1948, when Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein in a surprisingly popular comedy outing, Universal would retire the first string of monsters from serious horror filmmaking. Now, while Universal's offerings slip from horror to formula, a small division at RKO, the smallest of the big five studios, would start to lay stylistic foundations for low-budget horror films to come. Val Luton, a journalist, novelist, and poet turned story editor for David O. Selznick, was put in charge of a low-budget division at RKO to produce horror films for a measly $150,000 apiece. The catch, the studio would provide the title, Luton would develop the story. The first title, Cat People, which would be directed by Jacques Tourneau and photographed by the film noir veteran Nicholas Musaraka in 1942. Using leftover studio sets and creating the scares by using mood and shadow rather than makeup and monsters, Cat People was truly a glimpse at the more psychologically scary films in the decades to come. Costing $141,000 but bringing over $4 million in the first two years, Luton's low-budget horror division was practically saving the always cash-strapped RKO. The period between post-World War II years and the 1950s was perhaps the most difficult time Hollywood has ever gone through. From Supreme Court rulings ripping apart the studio system to a death match against television for patrons, this time period saw an increasingly protective Hollywood trying desperately to stay relevant. Horror films got relegated to strictly B-film status as Hollywood preserved its A-list talent for lavish epics. But the horror film was still popular with the teens who wanted thrills, even if the plot lines were ridiculous. The icy Soviet-American arms race meant that the nuclear boogeyman was always on top of mind. Horror films tapped into this Cold War fear of invasion, blending into a pulp science fiction cycle with films like The Thing from Another World and The Day the Earth Stood Still, both from 1951, and Forbidden Planet and The Invasion of the Body Snatchers, both in 1956. But monsters didn't only come from outer space. Creatures also emerged from the deep, like the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms in 1953, Creature from the Black Lagoon in 1954, and of course, the Japanese nuclear monster Godzilla, also in 1954. By the mid-1950s, the pulp sci-fi horror cycle would start to wear down and be taken over by exploitative producers like William Castle, who relied on gimmicks to sell tickets to low-rent horror outings. In Macabre, 1958, Castle promised every customer a $1,000 life insurance policy should they die of fright during the screening. 
House on Haunted Hill in 1959 was filmed in Emergo, which triggered a skeleton that would fly around the theater suspended on wires. Once kids knew this was coming, they'd bring their slingshots and see who could shoot it down. The Tingler, also in 1959, wired up movie theater seats with joy buzzers and encouraged audiences to scream as a way of calming down the spine monster that was supposedly let loose in the theater. From the 1960s on, we begin to see a massive explosion of styles and cycles in the horror genre as it gained both in popularity and prestige and freedom once the restrictive censorship of the production code was abandoned in 1964. Now, no discussion of horror could be self-respecting without the mention of the maestro himself, Mr. Alfred Hitchcock. Honing his precise abilities to play the audience like a musical instrument, it was 1960s Psycho that shocked audiences into believing that horror could be more than B-film fare. Unlike the monsters of previous horror cycle, Norman Bates was rooted in reality, an everyday human on the outside, but a psychological monster in the mind. Hitchcock would deliver another natural horror with The Birds in 1963. Now, on the other end of the Atlantic Ocean, Hammer Films production in the United Kingdom began rebooting Universal's gothic horror monsters, but this time adding sex and gore. Shot in full color, Hammer's first gothic horror reboot was Terence Fisher's The Curse of Frankenstein, with Peter Cushing as Dr. Frankenstein and Christopher Lee as the monster. For the first time in a Frankenstein film, blood was being shown on the screen, and in full chilling color. Between 1957 and 1974, Hammer cranked out seven Frankenstein movies, six Draculas, nine other vampire outings, two Jekyll and Hyde's, and three mummy films. The Hammer Studios, located on the banks of the River Thames, even became the setting of its own parody as its country-style down-place mansion was used as a set for Rocky Horror Picture Show in 1975, a film that in itself is a send-up of Hammer Horror style. Well, back in the U.S., perhaps inspired by the success of Hammer's approach to sex and gore, was the legendary B-movie producer Roger Corman. Now, whereas Alfred Hitchcock would meticulously storyboard his films and often enjoyed studio financial backing, Corman pumped his films out as fast as he could. Little Shop of Horrors in 1960 was shot just under three days with a budget of $30,000, using sets that had been left over from another Corman film, Buckets of Blood. A Corman knew what audiences wanted, blood and babes, and he delivered. His greatest acclaim, though, as a director came from his Edgar Allan Poe cycle, released between 1959 and 1964, collaborating with screenwriter Richard Matheson and actor Vincent Price in films like House of Usher, The Pit and Pendulum, Tales of Terror, and The Raven. Now, horror was starting to be taken seriously both at the highest levels of film production and at the lowest, setting the stage for many important horror sub-genres that would come in the following decades. The occult, films about Satan and supernatural were popular big-budget subjects, starting with Roman Polanski's Rosemary's Baby in 1968, which was actually a William Castle project. Then came what many consider the greatest entry in the occult cycle, 1973's The Exorcist, directed by William Friedkin. This was followed in 1976 with Richard Donner's The Omen and Stuart Rosenberg's Amityville Horror in 1979. The film school generation, a group of filmmakers who grew up on and formally studied horror, began to inject B-movie horror devices into their mainstream work. A Steven Spielberg's Jaws in 1975 made creature horror big business, igniting not only a shark cycle, 
but the whole summer blockbuster style of production and marketing. A Brian De Palma's 1976 Carrie set the stage for teen horror cycle by turning Stephen King's first novel into big box office and Oscar nominations for the leads. 1979's Alien by Ridley Scott successfully remixed horror and science fiction as did John Carpenter's remake of The Thing in 1982, which was neither a box office or a critical success, but has stood the test of time to be one of the most terrifying special effects films ever made. Now Spielberg would return to horror in 1982's Poltergeist working with Toby Hooper to create a masterful ghost story which was released only a week away from Spielberg's other 1982 hit, E.T. And then there's 1980's The Shining, which in true Stanley Kubrick fashion defies any category or imitation. Again, not a critical hit, it won Kubrick a Razzie Award for Worst Director, and only a mild box office success in its time, the Shining would go on to become the absolute must-watch film for any student of horror. Come and play with us. Come and play with us, Daddy. Forever. And ever. Horror has been a staple of the low budget world since the Universal Creature days. And as film production technology progresses and costs steadily decrease, the rise of independent filmmakers means the rise of new takes on horror. Toby Hooper's Texas Chainsaw Massacre in 1974, based on serial killer Ed Gain, who was also the inspiration for Psycho and Science of the Lambs, was shot on a skeleton budget in the sweltering Texas summer heat. Mired in money issues, the cast and crew didn't see much financial reward from the film's success, but the rawness of the teenagers in peril inspired many more teen horror slasher imitations. Then in 1978 came John Carpenter's Halloween, one of the most successful independent horror films ever made. Produced on a budget of $325,000 and grossing nearly $240 million dollars as of 2012, Halloween is the first of its kind Hitchcock-inspired slasher film. Well, unlike many of its follow-ups and imitators, Halloween actually contains very little graphic violence or gore. Without much money to spend on sets, and props, and special effects, Carpenter constructed his horror inside everyday suburbia. The Michael Myers mask is just a $2 Captain Kirk mask painted white but Terror in the Backyard worked. Friday the 13th, directed by Sean S. Cunningham in 1980, and A Nightmare on Elm Street by Wes Craven in 1984, were both studio-backed slasher films that followed the similar Horror in the Backyard formula to tremendous success and numerous, numerous sequels. But independent horror wasn't just about the slasher. In 1981, a group of young kids, Bruce Campbell, Sam Raimi, and Robert Tappert, released a small independent film which they had made by raising $150,000 from local investors. The film, The Evil Dead, was heavy on splatter effects and stop motion gore, gained a cult following, especially after it was released on a relatively new home video tape market in 1983. In fact, this promise of the distribution through new technologies like videotape and cable unleashed a flood of blood-soaked horror films that were never intended for the theater. When the 90s came around, the slasher cycle had pretty much run its course and was starting to fall into parody. Even Raimi's magic spell zombie was being parodied by Peter Jackson's Dead Alive, also known as Brain Dead, in 1992, which ratcheted up the Evil Dead splatter effects to a comical 11. 
Wes Craven's self-aware slasher film Scream in 1996 about a killer among a group of kids who already know all the rules of slasher films rebooted the new teen horror cycle, which led to I Know What You Did Last Summer, directed by Jim Gillespie, and Final Destination, directed by James Wong. Monster films turned increasingly to CGI effects for scares such as Species and Anaconda. Psychological horror and thriller have remained popular throughout the 90s and 2000s, including films like Silence of the Lambs, The Sixth Sense, Seven, The Others, and The Ring. But there are three modern horror film cycles that arose in the late 90s and the 2000s that are somewhat unique to our modern era. Torture porn, as it is disparagingly labeled, is a modern reboot of the splatter film going back to the Hammer horror era. But this latest cycle emphasizes intense gore, grunge, and often tortuous violence. The Saw franchise, the most successful horror film franchise of all time, is considered the first and the latest crop of splatter films with its first installment in 2004 by James Wan. This was followed by Eli Roth's Hostel in 2005, where the moniker torture porn was coined by critic David Edelstein. The Blair Witch Project, directed by Eduardo Sanchez and Daniel Myrick, and released in 1999, represents the first major film in the modern found footage horror subgenre. Though a borrowed idea from Cannibal Holocaust from 1980, the Blair Witch Project used the device of piecing together first-hand footage to reconstruct the late, last terrifying moments of the original eyewitness. Blair Witch also holds the title of being one of the first films ever marketed almost entirely on the internet. Now, the found footage device would go into common use from small films like Oren Pelly's Paranormal Activity in 2007, and even large creature films like Matt Reeves' Cloverfield in 2008. And finally, we cannot end this overview of horror without the most recent zombie cycle. With roots going back to George A. Romero's Night of the Living Dead in 1968, the modern zombie apocalypse cycle began when Danny Boyle breathed new life into the undead with 28 Days Later in 2002. Recent zombie films feed on our fears of a medical pandemic and breakdown of society, fears brought on by the financial meltdown of the mid-2000s. Now, still going strong with films like World War Z and the long-form television melodrama The Walking Dead, the zombie cycle may be seeing its fade out as comedic outings like Shaun of the Dead and Zombieland have poked fun at the formula. There's something about horror films that can transcend national and cultural boundaries. As the digital democratization of filmmaking continues, horror will be a genre that can delight or terrify people no matter where they are or what language they speak. This is because horror works on us differently than other genres, a topic I'll explore in the next video on the psychology of scary movies. But as we've seen in this detailed but no way exhaustive survey of the history of horror, the next big scary movie can come from anywhere. No matter the budget, stars, or country of origin, horror is very much a director's genre. All that matters is, can you make an audience shiver with fright? Go out there, make something scary. I'm John Hess, I'll see you at filmmakeriq.com. <laughs>